we're training these AI algorithms and we're training them on data made by humans. And mm -hmm. all of that reflects the preoccupations, the difficulties, the previous conversations that we've had within societies. And so that is something that I really try to talk to the boys about, to be this kind of critical voice going like, okay, why was it made? What's it intending you to do? And how does it want you to interact with it? And can you change that and do something different? And I think mm. that then really does extend into virtual worlds because as soon as you create a virtual world, you can create something that is utopian and then you put people in it. <laughs> <laughs> Attention all citizens of the future. Buckle up and step into our time tunnel of imagination to join us on an extraordinary journey into the days of futures past. Remember those flying cars and space rockets, the robot maids and cities on Mars that dazzled your childhood dreams of life beyond? This, my friends, is where our adventure begins. So let's go to our guide that excavator of the eventual, that historian of the hereafter, that recorder of retro futures, Theo Priestley. Hello and welcome to another episode of Days of Futures Past where I get to talk with a special guest about their science fiction influences when they were a child and what visions of the future they wanted to see come true. Today with I have Bay Backner who is a Web3 producer and creator of Collective Virtual Experiences. She is the founder and director of Mesh Fair, the virtual art fair for 3D, metaverse and VR creators and co-founder of Vuleta. Uh, international art collective producing immersive installations in Decentraland. Uh, Bay also produces Metaverse Art Week, Decentraland Wellness Week and Decentraland Gaming Week. Very busy. Uh, she is also the Assistant Professor of Emerging Technologies for the MA program in Global Entertainment and Music Business at Berkeley Valencia. Bay, hey. welcome. <laughs> Thank you for having me. That's a hell of a uh, bio. I mean, you must be very busy at the moment. I, uh, yeah, I keep forgetting about things and then people email me and going, oh yeah, that conference you're speaking at in two weeks, we need a title. And I'm like, um, cool. <laughs> 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 so it's, it's super nice. It's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, the world is moving so quickly and mm. it's trying to keep, keep track of all that. Do you find that the the whole spatial computing thing that's been kicked off by the the release of the Apple Vision Pro is kind of renewed interest in virtual experiences, or has it just remained pretty much consistent all the way through? Oh no, you know what it's like. It's like a just waves. So mm. just riding these waves. So now it's the spatial internet, spatial computing wave that will last as what? Should we should we make a prediction? Ten months. <laughs> <laughs> let's go let's go 10 to 18 months i think we did we did metaverse wave in about 24 months i think that that played out so i would say these hype cycles are getting shorter so it's that 18 months but behind the scenes like everyone's just working on the tech i mean this is hmm. this is the game that like we have the hype and behind the scenes we're just building it's the, the cliche of our space you know, yeah Everyone's building. Yeah, great. <laughs> and what's it like building events in Decentraland then? Because, I mean, you, you literally pull together week-long events in a yeah. sense, you know, Wellness Week and uh, Gaming Week. So that must take a, you know, as much effort as it does for a physical event, surely. It does. And you have on, on the top of that the layers of code. So hmm. a lot of it is about about working out what's possible at any given moment. And I work with teams of creators so for example for wellness week i had 16 different teams of creators building which means that i sort of have to be the central point of of knowing what's possible and also lending a hand with the code on that as well because you you that's the, the joy of doing uh any kind of virtual reality or or metaverse installation right now is that everyone's pushing hmm. so it's about trying to push what we can do as as far as we can with the tools that we have available um, and also having humans involved in that is the thing that coders <laughs> <laughs> kind of don't uh, expect. So you have um, this pull between 
what's possible, what people expect, what what the participants, how great they want to collaborate. I mean, I, I, you probably know that Decentraland has a DAO as well. Mm. So our community is hugely active and engaged in what we do in terms of the festivals and events. So it's a lot like Burning Man, that you have people contributing, people coming together. And then on top of that, you have layers of code and um, glitches and unexpected things that then you need to quickly scramble and, and kind of, get technical to resolve it's 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 super super fun but also draws mm. on both sides humans yeah. and code <laughs> um talk, when, when you mention hype cycles obviously web3 and the metaverse went through its own sort of hype cycle yeah. in a sense you know like you say you know in the web3 world seems to come in waves every four years along with the crypto side I mean, do you still believe in that kind of sort of future of the, you know, of a decentralized internet and, and what the kind of sort of shape it's, you know, the shape it's in now, is that going to be the same shape it's going to be in in like five years time, for example? Oh, it's a really good question. I mean, I was in mobile phones before iPhone and I was working with open source communities on building operating systems for phones that could be open source. There was an amazing guy at Nokia called Ari Yaxi, who was mm -hmm. like leading this innovative, creative movement at Nokia to start opening everything, and, you know, being this center of, of innovation. And obviously then iPhone just comes in. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where the industry moves, these, these closed environments that just work and people in the wider the wider world can kind of get excited by and buy in and and don't decentralization hasn't really made that leap yet mm. into into what that actually means outside of our industry and and how to make it this compelling case that for a lot of us it is within the industry mm. um, people you know from open source backgrounds people building DAOs, people wanting the next wave of virtual experience to be this open ecosystem and what we're seeing now is Fortnite. You know, like I don't yep. know if you saw yesterday that Disney's just put this massive mm -hmm. investment into Fortnite. This is what happens. So it's it's fighting the fight on both fronts. Like trying to make these environments as open as possible for creators, but also realizing that we need to be better at communicating. But then, you know, there's that whole thing you can't educate the market. You can't tell people why this is important. So for me as a creator, it's just about creating the work and seeing if we can get things out there that really inspire and, and engage people on, on being part of these virtual experiences. Yeah. That that project at Nokia then, or the work that was doing, was that, was that part of like the Symbian, was it Symbian yeah. OS that they had? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there was like these incredible people, like there was something called, um, what are they called? Access that were a completely open source operating system. Um, there was an open source phone called Neo, and there was this team who were like just building this whole open source phone, um, this kind of hacker culture around, mm. we can't be using these closed devices. We've got to have these devices that we can get to every level that we want with them. And all those guys went on to incredible careers within tech. So that's the kind of um, the positive of all that. I know that the people with that, that I work with now some of the most like, uh, inspiring, engaged people working in VR and virtual realities and immersive experience, spatial computing, whatever you want to call it at any mm. point. But these, are, you know, there's this whole wave of people coming through that, uh, you know, it's it's just a really inspiring place to to hang out and start start hacking. Do you think then um, it's not going to be us that's going to? I mean, we can kick off. Uh, you know, our generations can kick off the kind of, um, you know, the move to decentralization um, and almost recapturing what the web was right at the start, which was free and open. Mm -hmm. And it's really for the next generation like Gen Z and Gen Alpha to sort of take forward because you can almost see that there's a cultural backlash in terms of everything has been pushed towards digital and renting and no ownership. And now even sort of Gen Z and Gen Alpha are starting to look back and go, well, hang on a minute, I quite liked having physical objects mm -hmm. and maybe I want to actually take control again. And this could help with some of the decentralization aspects because like you say, you know, we've got Apple and that's a very closed walled garden ecosystem. 
Um, I've always said that Epic Epic Games is a is another closed ecosystem totally. in itself. Yeah, even though you know Tim Sweeney uh, makes lots of noise around Apple is bad and Epic is good. Um, and, and and want to make it as open as possible. But the thing is, it's open within its own ecosystem and and they own the whole ecosystem. And like you say, Disney has now pushed, uh, you know, 1.5 billion, I think, mm-hmm. into obviously creating experiences in Fortnite, but that's not going to be an open system at all by any means. No, I got my students like literally this week. So we, we did realities yesterday and I teach on the MA program. So most come from... The music industry so mm. this week uh, we have teams of two people each going into each metaverse environment to evaluate can we actually create that so like we've got a fortnite team we've got a decentraland team we've got a sandbox team we've got a hyperfy uh spatial old school and we've got like mm. you know different uh, nifty island which has recently come in and like a lot of people are migrating to nifty island like these spaces of going yeah can we create that first and then secondly, can we monetize our creativity in that space? Mm. Like, can we actually start being paid as creatives for what we're producing without being one of these huge studios? And that's mm. what Web3 decentralized in the first place. It's like, you don't have to have a huge studio. You can start selling and promoting your work to that kind of thousand true fans trope. You know, the whole thing that we sold, we kind of all bought into at the beginning of Web3. And now with virtual environments, we have to have that same conversation. Um, and I think you're right that the next generations are kind of going to see this at some point because my sons now invest so much in Fortnite. You know, they have their reality in Fortnite. They have their skins. They have their battle passes. Mm. And when I show them Decentraland, they kind of get really excited because they're like, "Mom, can I make a skin then? It's like, yeah, you totally can. Okay, so if I make a skin, can I sell it? Yeah, you can. Like, okay, well, I want to do that one. That sounds cooler. I don't have to just buy things that are already in the mm. shop. I can start <clears throat> making and I can start selling stuff. I can start connecting with other creators. Um, but that's that's how they're kind of they're seeing it play out in our house. Yeah. That's not the conversation that's happening in, with most Fortnite users who are like, yeah, cool, we've got the next game coming out and uh, Kid Leroy is doing a new concert and I can get mm. it. <laughs> do, you think, do you think the language in Web3 then uh, and uh, the fact that a lot of the, you know, the blockchain tech and NFTs are always the th- first things that people seem to want to speak about. So it's, oh, it's built on this particular blockchain and this particular blockchain does however many TPS, which is transactions per second, blah, blah, blah. And and it's that kind of language and the focus on the tech that kind of puts people off because they don't really see the utility and the use case for it. I was talking, you know, thinking about this show and um, talking with, with people. I think we got put off a lot in the 90s by films about hacking because the narrative around Web3 is that Mm. it's hackers and that your wallet is going to get stolen. And I was teaching realities yesterday and um, the course director was like, oh, God, it's like that Sandra Bullock film where she gets her identity (laughs) stolen. Yes, that. And so it's understanding that we've grown up with these tropes of, this, the internet is a, is a dangerous, crazy place. Mm. And that if we invest too much of ourselves in this reality, then someone's going to come in, duplicate our identity, become us. You know, there's this, this sense that it's not safe. And my kids definitely don't have that. I, they, they were showing me, you know, Roblox. I was in playing Doors the other day in Roblox. And there's just loads of people in the entrance foyer. And with our generation, we were told all the time about stranger danger and, mm. you know, not talking to anyone that you don't know. <laughs> and all these kids are just like, yeah, la, 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 just, just chatting away in the comments section. And as a parent, I'm like, no, you know, this, this is a unsafe environment. Mm. And then I check myself and think, okay, but that's, that's the narrative that we had growing up then. And I wonder if, for our generation, yeah, Web3 seems this like off-putting 
crazy wild west place and for our kids they're just like meh it's fine mm. you know <laughs> the, the, <laughs> but maybe that's because they're they're working in these closed environments um i don't know it's it's a big question i think i think for the most part that when you look back at how the web was created i mean the web was created you know on tim berners lee's desk and then it took two years to hack together 50 websites as people started to get to grips with it. And it's no different in a sense. You know, the parallels are there in terms of, well, it's very embryonic. It's a hacker culture because people yeah. just want to hack code together and stuff like that. But of course, we've got this 30 year period in between where, you know, the, the second generation of the web came up and everything's been handed to us on a plate. So we've got browsers instead of having to code something to be viewed on a website. You know, we've got apps. All this kind of we've got things that you know um website builders and everything else so all of a sudden the web has become very lazy because the services were built on top to stop us from actually hacking things together and almost web 3 is a step back and saying well actually let's play let's play with code again and to me that's re really exciting even you know um even for my generation i think it's far more exciting to think that we can hack something back together again and actually make a better job of it um than you know like, like you say you know the, the taking the stranger danger approach and saying oh this is bad <laughs> that kind of sort of thing i mean when you when you mentioned stranger danger it was actually I, I, the first thing that popped into my head was charlie yeah um charlie says meow, 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 <laughs> yeah. and he's eating the eating the fish and it's like you know don't get into that stranger's car with the with the puppies in it puppies um <laughs> offering you sweets and stuff <laughs> and yeah but that, yeah it's um yeah, it's, it's funny when you look backwards. So you were um, born in the 80s. I was. Um, my favourite decade. Um, what was that like growing up back then? Because, I mean, it's, you know, very different in terms of... I mean, we've had sort of guests on the show who were born in the 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, and now we're getting into the 80s and the 90s. So you were born in the 80s, but I guess you kind of sort of grew up more in the 90s. I was early 80s, actually. So, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, I was an 80s kid, yeah. So what was that like in terms of, you know, the inspiration that was around you for, you know, as a child and, and the, the things, the technologies and the things that excited you? I think I've mentioned to you, my dad is a huge technologist. Yeah. So he, he was surrounded by like elf computers and, you know, early anything that came in, he would play with. So we had a dial up modem quite early and <laughs> it was all about, Again, we had valves, you know, like the old school computer mm -hmm. valves in the garage. Yep. Um, and so he would just be hacking away at various electronic systems. And so that was how we grew up. It was me and my sister and we'd just be surrounded by these things that we didn't understand at all. But the smell of a soldering iron just, <laughs> just going <laughs> and being like it, we, it still goes over our heads. We, I, you know, I feel for my dad that he doesn't have someone he can kind of wig out about resistors right. and diodes and um like but he'll be like oh yeah i made my own power supply yesterday like okay. <laughs> very <laughs> random <laughs> okay, so if you needed a specific so yeah um we grew up with that so it was very much just surrounded by 80s electronics and mm. then on the other side we watched a heck of a lot of television like most of the children in the 80s so the television was always on and we just watched whatever was on the three, then four channels mm. <laughs> that were available. And then we were quite late in getting a video machine because mum and dad said that we already watched enough television. So they weren't going to add to that by having videos. And so it was that sense of we, when we finally got a video machine, I think I was about 11. And then it was like, OK, cool. We went with mum like every Tuesday to Blockbuster and picked a really inappropriate film. So <laughs> <laughs> my mum was really into like Arnold Schwarzenegger and like, right. yeah, anything that was kind of, I watch them now with, I, I watch a review and go, okay, well maybe I can watch that with my kids. And my kids are like eight, 12 and 13. And the answer is always no. <laughs> 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 so yeah, Robocop, uh, just, you name them, uh, Total Recall, mm. 
um, the big Arnie films, then everything like Conan the Barbarian, like anything with this sort That's of... That's a classic, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> big 80s violent films, Mad Max, all of the Mad Maxes. Yeah, like from Blockbuster on a Tuesday in the video machine. And the ones that we had recorded. So I think we had Blade Runner on a, like a rip from the TV. Hmm. And we had Diamonds Are Forever on a rip. So me and my sister just watched those over and over again. I like, oh, watch you do now. Oh, watch Diamonds Are Forever. <laughs> and yeah, so that's that's how we grew up in the eighties. James Bond, dial up modems, soldering irons, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. And your dad st- is still handy with a soldering iron totally today because I I took I took a look a look at what he's been working on and he's building his own robots and yeah. things like that. Yeah, it's he crazy. Has, he's built a Japanese monorail in the garage. There is, <laughs> as <laughs> um, you do. Yeah, there is a Japanese monorail and it has helicopters that actually fly over it. And um, yeah, it's and he does all the electronic systems himself. So in the shed there is a working railway inspired by the West Clay Railway, which is an actually Irish railway. And he's mm-hmm. coded all the trains to make the um, specific noises that the trains make as they pass each other. And you can code each train independently. Yeah, it's, he's, he's wild. I think the closest I've ever seen in film to my dad is the, the robot maker in Blade Runner. You know, when, right. when yes. she visits the yes. guy, yeah, that's my house. <laughs> <laughs> all the robots kind of coming to see you like stuff going on yeah that was that was my house so you mentioned actually one of my favorite cartoons um yeah, as, a, as a serious influence which is ulysses 31 totally. and and for anyone who doesn't know um ulysses 31 was a 1980s era um cartoon french cartoon um of um, Greek mythology set in space. I mean, you just couldn't get any wilder. And, you know, Ulysses himself was essentially like a ginger-haired space Jesus with yes. jetpacks and a laser sword. Mm-hmm. Um, and a, a f- interesting fact is that we tried to secure the IP for this uh, to make a video game based on um, based on Ulysses 31, but we found out that it's almost stuck in IP hell because oh, wow. the original creator sold it on, as you do with IP every now and again, you kind of sell it on, and large corporation that's that has lots of children's cartoons and children's TV programs now owns it, but it's essentially locked away in a vault that nobody can touch um, because they just don't want anyone to touch it. But... Um, yeah, Ulysses 31 was just absolutely fantastic. I mean, it just really was, I don't know, you know, hippies in space in a sense. He was a real space hippie Jesus taking on the Greek myth. I mean, what was it about that particular cartoon that really kind of sort of caught your eye? I was obsessed by it. It was my absolute favourite thing for, for ages. That and Cities of Gold, the, the two. Right? Okay, right. Yeah. Um, I think, but I look back on it now and go, hmm, okay, so there's this, anyone that hasn't watched it, there are Telemachus and Ulysses, the two main characters, the two protagonists. Mm. And then you have this fragile blue girl space alien that they have to rescue in the first place. And then they kind of take her along with them for some reason. And everyone else is frozen. So everyone else is cryogenically frozen in this Mm. this thing because they take on the Cyclops and they lose. And okay, fine. Um, And they just fly around and the computer in the spaceship is a lady as well so they have this talking lady computer that basically tells them off and goes what should i do next and then talking jesus goes okay give me this readout and she goes okay and then they fly to different places have battles with sirens and other greek mythology things and then meanwhile there's a comedy robot No, no. (laughs) No, no, the robot who eats nuts. And I was fascinated with that. There's this mechanical robot who eats nuts. And for some reason, they bring him along. He's the pet (laughs) of Telemachus. And they all have adventures together. As you do. It's... (laughs) (laughs) Um... What? But it, you know, so I mean, the, the, you know, as wild as it is, I mean, obviously it's thirty first. It was set in the thirty first century, hence Ulysses thirty one, giant spaceships, which was the Odyssey. Um, 
and Sherka. Sherka, the, the computer, yeah. Was the computer, that's right. And then you had Nono, um, Telemachus, Ulysses. Yumi. You don't remember her Yumi. name. You're like, yes. <laughs> who was the blue yes. alien? The only girl. She was called Yumi and she was telepathic Yumi, and had right. like a funny ball on her head. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was wild. But I mean, you know, you look back and you had, you know, you had robot robotics, which you we're did. all living with nowadays. You had intelligent computers, which we're now living with. I mean, obviously this, you know, back in the 80s, you, you could draw parallels to stuff like Star Trek, where, where it had kind of the same thing, blue alien or blue blooded alien or green blooded, actually, you know, Spock, you had the talking computer, etc., etc. I mean, was were, were there any other sort of cultural references that you can remember that you kind of put you on this path that you're that you're on now as an adult? Oh, I think it's that sense of escapism. I remember watching Daryl. Do you remember Daryl? Yes. D a r y l. So he was this robotic, genetically engineered boy that didn't realize that he wasn't real, and that had a, a huge impact and this kind of 80s alienation films for children. Hmm. Um, similar with Flight of the Navigator. Like, I think um, that's probably come up for you quite a few times with this sense of going out on your own, doing something that's like creating your own reality and being something different, being an outsider. I think that's hmm. probably a, a big, for a lot of us working in, like I work in a really diverse community in terms of, who I, a lot of the people I collaborate with, I only know as avatars. So I have, you know, <laughs> relationships with people that I've only met in avatar form. A lot of us talk about the sense of, um, when we were doing wellness week, I was having conversations about virtual identity. And for a lot of people in this space, virtual identity is actually more significant for them in terms of their um, own sense of self as real life identity. And I think a lot of the, that's something that really fascinates me about this space. And I think a lot of it comes from these ideas of outsiderhood, what is real, what is creative, what is constricted. I was hugely into fantasy films like Labyrinth, Never Ending mm. Story, where you're going into these different worlds and you're not really sure what is constructed, what is real, what is in your imagination, what is actually physically existing in the outside world. And I think a lot of my fascination with constructed environments, and I'm, but I'm not a gamer, like I've never been a gamer because I felt like that was, I only became involved in metaverse and um, alternate realities when it started to be that you could meet other people in those realities and mm. start having that relationship sense and creating together and, and discovering together in these places and and creating and changing um so yeah i think it all comes from this weird 80s escapist fantasy stuff that we're all saturated in you know legend <laughs> labyrinth never ending story yeah. the list of these things and for many of us if you had it like yeah burnt on a video you just like every <laughs> blessing play and getting into that that escapism was was a big thing yeah, wear the tape out. Yeah, yeah totally. And, and, yeah, and then, and then I guess from from like, let me think, from the sort of nineties, early nineties onwards, then, you know, when we had dial up, yes. <laughs> dial up, <laughs> uh, um, we had dial up, but but of course we were living with um, earlier examples of virtual worlds, and and I guess you could see the promise of what what could come in the future. It just the speed at which we could access it just wasn't there at that point in time. Mm -hmm. I mean, were you playing, or you know, were you playing around with computers around in the sort of early nineties as well, then, or late nineties, I guess. Well, I did a physics degree, bizarrely. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I was playing around with like the old school stuff, like oscilloscopes and. Um, oh right. Yeah, yeah. it was super, old, <laughs> super old school. So, the way my degree worked. So this was I. When did I go? Is it ninety nine that I would have. So yeah, early nine, so mid to early nineties, I was definitely wanting to do stuff. I watched Hackers and thought, okay, that's mm. the coolest thing ever. And I said to my dad, I want to create a website. And he said, you don't know what you put on it. Like you need something to say on it. And I was like, oh, okay. And so I think there was that stranger danger thing. Like you can't have a website because that's like mm. in the mm. world mm. wide web. What, you know, 
Um, so I sort of didn't play with that until I started writing blogs, creating like the old school, you know, the old school blogs, the kind of just text, yeah, you know, story blogs. I got really into the blogging movement and at the same time as at uni, so I was getting into, yeah, measuring the lifetime of a muon. <laughs> 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 Oh no. Yeah. Just computers is this bit, but like high tech, like, okay, mm. like particle accelerators and um, super fluids and, you know, like, they don't, you know, like, I've just, and I got, we had, we had this laboratory and it was like every Monday you had to go into the laboratory and you were briefed and you had like a load of equipment in front of you and you weren't allowed to leave until you'd completed your experiment. And so you were literally in an underground basement with a load of physicists <laughs> <laughs> and you weren't allowed to leave until you finished. And I, wow, it was, it was difficult. Usually I would persuade some, some chap, like, hey, <laughs> can you help me leave? <laughs> <laughs> I want to go outside. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that it was it was high tech aroma like for for that period do you see parallels then between your childhood or differences between your childhood and your children's and in terms of how you know they view technology whether it's optimistic whether it's dystopian yeah. and what what are they looking forward towards in terms of you know the future how do they see the future panning out it's a really interesting one. Like, I hope that they're growing up in kind of a hacker culture, so they mm. feel okay taking things apart, like messing with it, doing something different with it, um, trying to balance screen time with fantasy play and interactivity in real mm. life as well. I'm really yeah. into the fact mm. that they love things like Dungeons and Dragons and Warhammer I feel like it scratches the same itch as a lot of the video games, but they can they have this like the tact the the fact that they can yeah interact in a way that that takes them somewhere different. My the, my children are obsessed though with um, video game history. Like one of my boys, okay, yeah, he did this like a, a history of video games on EDX course, and he did this. So now he's telling me about oh yeah, and you know in the nineteen eighty two games crash. Then, <laughs> God, <laughs> how it made me feel old as well. <laughs> like, Mum, did you play GoldenEye? Like, mm, yeah, I did when I was babysitting some kids that had GoldenEye. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was trying to tell them about, like, my first video game was like, uh, I can't, I, I tried to find it. It was called Under the House. And it was on a black and orange screen where we used to play it. It didn't have any graphics, mm -hmm. it was just text. And it would be, you'd have to try and get the basement of a house just basically typing yes or no, you know, like these kind of, and it was on a tape. Right. So you put it in a tape player, put it in, it mm -hmm. went, and then it would create this video game. And it was just yes or no. And I, yeah, it feels like it's been wiped from history. That weird thing of it was because it was before the internet and it was mm. probably like a very niche game that my dad had got from a garage or something. You know, in like the UK, like you just used to get things from the garage. You'd go and get your petrol and then they'd pick up some glasses or a, yeah. Yeah, or a video game or a, a <laughs> tape of an audio book of Cinderella. That's what you'd get from the garage as well, because you'd collect your Texaco points and they'd stick the stickers on and then you'd go and claim, yep. yeah, claim whatever it was. So I'm sure this thing came from the garage, probably. So who knows? But it was really embedded in my, I think, early consciousness of this being something you could create, that this thing was weaving a story hmm. just by you going, yes, no. Do you want to pick up the key? Yes. Are you sure you want to pick up the key? <laughs> <laughs> That's that's almost like um, the fighting fantasy books where you know you would turn a page yeah. something, but I would I would always keep like a finger on the, the <laughs> last page before just in case it ended up being the wrong choice. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think 
my kids but for like i think these things are cool. universal though like the kids still love those kind of things you know mm. like yeah choose your own adventure books you give one of those to the kids yeah like, that's awesome or i think they would still respond to this orange and black text video game if i could find what the heck it's... if anyone <laughs> listening <laughs> knows what that thing was yeah it's it's an interesting thing that i think kids are the same it's just we're giving them these different inputs and hopefully if they're growing up in an environment where they feel they can build with that and mess with mm. it and take it apart and i think the deconstruction part is actually really important um, because you get to learn how something works yeah. And it, it does go back to the sort of hacker culture, but also the sort of open nature of it all. I mean, and, and, and it's great that your kids are, you know, playing around with Dungeons and Dragons rather than kind of sort of video games because video games have guardrails and rules and you can't do everything. Although Baldur's Gate 3 is very a really yeah, good example good. of yeah. as free uh, in terms of options and things like that as you can get. But Dungeons and Dragons is very much in the case of it's it's my imagination. I take on a persona, which is a lot a lot like what some of the community, which is you know I adopt a, an avatar and a persona, and that is me. That's mm -hmm. you know ninety five percent of me is is that rather than in the real world, um, and and so I guess do you do you see a, a a future then where the virtual worlds that we have now are going to be completely wide open and free to let people express as much as possible without guardrails i think it's really i think going back to that thing with the kids is important to say that taking thing, things apart also proved to you that it was made by humans hmm. and that it's fallible and it's flawed and it's biased and it reflects all the cultural norms that that thing was created in and it may be exclusionary and it may not talk to you in such a way that it should based on your background your humanity, like all these kind of conversations that then go into technology that we don't really have as much conversation around it as we should have because it takes such a, an important role in our lives now and we're constructing these virtual environments and they're being made by humans and we're training these AI algorithms and we're training them on data made by humans. And mm -hmm. all of that reflects the preoccupations, the difficulties, the previous conversations that we've had within societies. And so, that is something that I really try to talk to the boys about, to be this kind of critical voice going like, okay, why was it made? What's it intending you to do? And how does it want you to interact with it? And can you change that and do something different? And I think mm. that then really does extend into virtual worlds because as soon as you create a virtual world, you can create something that is utopian and then you put people in it <laughs> and, it, yeah. and it turns into something else entirely and we kind of haven't really we've been so um what my i've been so privileged in my role that it, my role is working in virtual environments with people and bringing people together and creating things that have people in them and having to create things that make people collaborate in virtual mm. environments and that's a whole different conversation than isn't it really cool that we have spatial internet like, you know, isn't it really cool that we can make, we can render a perfect 3D world? Yes, absolutely, that's super cool. Now what happens when we bring <laughs> people from all over the world, from hugely different backgrounds, with hugely different life experiences, of hugely different ages, which is something we don't really talk about enough mm -hmm. online, that not only because, you know, there's that thing about age-appropriate content, but also because we read comments like they're written by someone our age. That's just how we interact with, mm. with interaction. We kind of, in our everyday lives, usually are just talking to people kind of in our own demographic and bubble. We don't have a serious conversation with a six-year-old. Whereas online, that person that we're talking to literally could be six. And we mm. have no idea. And it sounds like a really um, silly example, but it does happen now in virtual environments. And we don't have, um, we haven't really learned how to, to do that. So much mm. of our communication is nonverbal. The assumptions we make with people when we see them, when we see their faces, when we see, we impose kind of our prejudices, yes, but it also gives yeah. us a lot of cues in how to relate to that person. 
and our expectations of them and how much to take it seriously on a reflection of ourselves as well. And then virtual environments come in and go, boom, you have none of that. Yeah. <laughs> you have to start from scratch and decide how you're going to take every single interaction in that environment. And it's, it's wild. It's going to be all of these conversations are ahead of us. <laughs> are, we, um, are, we, are we improving or making matters worse when we actually add in AI on top of all of that as well? Oh, I don't know. Like, that's that question about technology, isn't it? Is it leading to mm. a utopian future? Is it leading to a dystopian future? And I'd say it's like all, everything we talk about when it comes to humans. It's grey. <laughs> just, just like Scottish weather. Yeah, you go either way. <laughs> uh, we can, yeah, I mean, it's going to be really interesting in terms of our perception of reality if we are within virtual environments. Like, the thing that really struck me about the um, spatial computing, all the analysis that's come out over the last three days about spatial computing, <laughs> um, is that this... this um, innovation called pass-through, that we're thinking that we're looking at the reality, that mm. we think that that is light waves coming from a table and hitting our eyeballs. And it's not. This is a digital rendering of the reality ahead of us. And so we as humans can then play in any way we want with that reality. And mm. we have no sense that it isn't reality unless we physically take off that mask. Because all of yeah. the cues that are coming into that like, are telling us that that is reality because we think it's a window. And when it's a 3D dinosaur and a butterfly that's landing on our finger, we can kind of know that's not real. But if I see mm. someone just wearing a dress, I'm not going to be double checking myself. Is that dress really real? Is that person wearing something that's real right now? I'm probably never going to make that check. Or does that, is that table blue? Is it pink? And so we have this huge now wave of interplay between reality that can take us somewhere it, yeah unimaginable in terms of our, our relationship with the thing that we see in front of our mm. eyes that literal visual connection with something that that interface is now is now shaping in in any way it chooses yeah i think as, as the as that kind of form factor becomes smaller and lighter and more transportable um i mean i've seen videos of people wearing the vision pro out in yeah. the streets and it just looks frankly absolutely weird and, and silly but you can understand it might get to a point where we'll, we'll wear glasses um, or even contacts when mm -hmm. it even gets right down to that level and we figure out battery life and etc um and and I, I can't remember if I actually wrote this in a blog post, but I remember thinking to myself, I, I could wear, you and I could wear glasses um, and we're walking along the street and my perception of reality will be shaped by whatever yeah. filters and whatever algorithms I have on me. Um, and you'll have the same. But if I look at you, you could actually have a filter that's, totally. that co completely represents something different as you. Like you say, you could be wearing different clothes. Your hairstyle could be different. You could actually be a completely rendered avatar. Yeah, it could be AI. You're, you could be an AI and um, your identity is almost masked and protected and, unless I decide to take off my glasses. And that's quite a weird future to think about mm -hmm. because, like you say, nothing that we perceive can be real. And it's almost we're getting to that stage with information, you know, just on social media and networks where yeah. it's just like, I don't know whether this is to trust this or not there's no source i can't fathom it out because it's all deep faked yep. and yet we could be wandering about in the next sort of 10 years with completely deep faked totally. all around us which is, is kind of scary um so going back and and you're you know your dad's building stuff and he's always tinkering and things like that and then you're watching sort of you know tv were there any sort of visions of the future that you that you thought would have come true by now or that you wish had come true by now that you thought were really cool back then as a child and and we're still waiting for it to happen today probably everyone says the same hoverboards obviously <laughs> <laughs> totally impractical as well but where are the hoverboards <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
like we should. Uh, we were promised hoverboards definitely by mm. 2024. They so this, yeah, ridiculous that we don't have hoverboards. We have those. Yeah, rubbish... hoverboards and flying cars yeah. are usually the ones that everybody seems to gravitate towards. Yeah, we have those rubbish patinettes. I don't know if they've taken off in England as much, but they're like motorized scooters. Like, oh uh, yeah. right, yeah, we've got a few things here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's. I would be totally it's cool not with the that. Same. No, they were hovering. Bring it on. So that also i don't know if you remember gem there was a cartoon like um he was, was gem in the holograms so it's like a right a rock star woman that could kind of transform her look just by going and it would go Shoo! and you could be you know you wouldn't have to do I, it would probably doesn't affect the majority of our listeners but the annoyance mm. of having to do your makeup every morning in <laughs> right. in blade runner they had a thing that come across your face and it goes Shh, and it would do your makeup for you. It's like a visor. And then Gem in mm. the hologram, she'd go like this. And it would just go, Ch-ch-ch, and you'd be done. I feel like this would be a technical advance for humanity if we had the ability to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it reminds me of the, um, you remember um, when you, you were talking about Robocop and um, Total Recall? Mm. The girl, the receptionist in the recall center actually had um, nails and she would tap them and, and and the nails would change color awesome yes uh, rather than having to paint them which which was uh, which was great um so hoverboards and flying devices, cars yeah hoverboards yeah well that's it and yeah. makeup systems that would just sort it for you every morning <laughs> <laughs> they would like assess your face shape you know we have it we have it in filters now like you can do it in filters but mm. that would actually do it in real life would go you have an oval face you would look good with a elongated cat eye. Let me do it for you. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's what we want. Um, so holograms then, do you think that, that we're going to get to a point in a kind of sort of science fiction future where holograms are going to overtake like spatial computing in a sense? Because they kind of remove the whole sense of having to wear something or, or the technology becomes more invisible. I think that's the big um, competition right now, isn't it? Whether we are going to be using wearables or whether mm. we're going to have this sense of these things being within our external reality. I would much rather go for holograms and still have the external reality around that. Mm. And I feel like maybe our interaction with the world would be a little bit more fluid and predictable with that reality. Yeah. I don't know if it's going to happen, though. I think probably the the water goes down the um, the easiest way down mm. the hill, and I think maybe yeah. Apple's kind of put a, a flag for this sense of, of wearable technologies. Everyone's kind of, yeah, as you say, looking to see, can they become more like glasses? Can we push them towards mm. something that doesn't seem as, as hefty? But as everyone said, I don't know if you... Did you see the Casey Neistat review of the... Um, it's no. really good. Have a have a watch. But it, that similar thing of going in as a skeptic and then seeing what the potential is for this tech and feeling, okay, yeah, there's something here. This is going to be the the pathway that we're all going to be taken on if we if we choose. <laughs> so yeah, okay, that's uh, one one view of of science fiction becoming a reality in a sense. You know, we've seen lots of um, well, I've read lots of books where and you know you've got snow crash and everything yeah. else which is obviously led to the metaverse and yeah. things um and these are starting to come to fruition as technology always try you know it's finally catching up mm-hmm. and, and allowing us to build those worlds um so talking about building a worlds what are you building next oh i'm doing mesh fair so i have right. 30 international artists many of whom are award winners in vr and um, 3d installation are all coming together in March and 30 of them, I, I give them all a 12 by 12 meter floating white cube. as kind of <laughs> the joke on the white cube gallery. Um, and so there'll be these 30 white cubes floating in a plaza. And in each one, each artist has the freedom to create any immersive experience that they choose. Mm. And I, yeah, I love it. We, we created it for the first time last year. Um, these in like, awesome installations there's like chess boards in which the avatars became installation pieces in a in a 
piece by Rebecca Rose against it, kind of looking at war and um, the iconography of war. Um, we had, wow, like a giant spinning D and D dice in a like like a, a trippy cat installation by an artist called right. Melaman. Like it's just awesome. And and this year we had um, just huge galleries involved as part of the curation and what's been really awesome is seeing some of the big gallery names that have already been in digital art so people like unit london or office and part in berlin suddenly getting excited as well about glb works and works mm. for virtual reality and virtual worlds and um i wrote a piece with you, Theo, a couple of months back. Do you That's remember? Right, yes. yes. Um, about how <laughs> how metaverse is is becoming a medium for a lot of radical artists. About looking at how we create these collective immersive experiences. And the only a strand going through all of this work is how we create digital experience that becomes memorable and changes us mm. as individuals. And for me, meshware is it's just that. It, the and the the connections and the friendships that get made through the show because it's still really glitchy like stuff goes wrong the whole time and you have to be so zen and it goes against a lot of um artistic practice because an artist you sort of want everything to be perfect you want to create this vision and deliver it and it's really important to you because you wouldn't be doing it if not because you're a visual artist and when we bring that into the metaverse you sort of have this group of people that go yes i'm a visual artist my work is important, but I understand <laughs> that something is going to, I'm going to have to change my vision. I'm going to have to work around something. There's going to be something that I can't do, or yeah. I put something in and everything looks different under that. Um, Cause we work with sky boxes. So I don't know if you know that like mm. each individual user in a metaverse can decide what time of day it is. So mm -hmm. if you're a painter, that's like hanging a painting in a nightclub. Like it's never something you would do in real life. <laughs> like, and a lot of people keep it in night mode. So you have to think about how your installation works on a really individual level for the people coming and you can't mm. even control their lighting. You can't control whether they've got it open in another browser window or you know, their avatar comes in and starts doing pole dancing around your, this is what happened last, last measure. And really? yeah, then we had a flash mob pole dance in an installation by uh, Stephen, Stefan, du du I'm going to get his last name wrong. So I'm just going to say his Twitter um, shortening, which is Stefan Duke. And um, right. yeah, so we just had a flash mob pole dance because the avatars start interacting with the creativity in the space. And you either love that and go, yeah, this is this is the future mm. of engagement within these installation pieces. Or you go, <laughs> that's not something I can take on. <laughs> <laughs> um, where can we find out more about Meshfair mm -hmm. and, and more about what you do and where, where to find you? Uh, Meshfair.com. So just right. go one word. Mesh, like a mesh, fair, like a fair, and then .com. And so... I haven't yet got all the artists announced on there. We announced the artists that are participating this week, or this year, last, this Monday gone. So I need to quickly get them on the website. <laughs> <laughs> and now start, start briefing about, we, they have just five weeks now to make their installations. And then we'll open the show on the 26th, which is part of the wider Decentraland Art Week as well. So gallery installs, mesh fair, loads of stuff going on with people creating this all this experimental work on the the, the mm. edge of what's possible in virtual realities right now and what about you personally do you have a website or do you just mostly hang out on LinkedIn and <laughs> <No>. or... <laughs> <laughs> darling i mostly hang out in decentral land <laughs> <laughs> so yeah um discord you can find me like um so baybackner.com if you want to find the official kind of yep. stuff or LinkedIn, Bay Wagner, or if you search for Bay on any of the, <laughs> the forums, <laughs> in a Decentraland, Mona, like, I'll be there. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, Bay, it's been an absolute pleasure having on board um, for this podcast. This Thank you very much for joining. Thank you so much for asking me about Ulysses 31. <laughs> no, no. And we have to get your dad in as well oh, at some point. Oh, that would be amazing. I want to... 
I want to sort of see all the that. I want, yeah, especially if he's going to be in his workshop, and I want uh, to see him like he could build a robot while he's on the podcast. You would totally hurt. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, uh, Bay, Bay, thank you very much indeed for this. This has been great. You're very thank welcome. you. Thank you for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Um, that's it for another podcast of Days of Futures Past. Please join me next time for another guest who wants to talk about science fiction, the visions of the future that they saw as a child, and maybe um, Bay's dad can come on uh, next <laughs> the next show and build us a robot in real time. Until next time, thank you. This is Days of Futures Past, signing off, when we'll once again peel back the curtain on more lost futures. Stay tuned, and remember... The future may be here, but the past never fades. Until next time. Days of Futures Past was brought to you by Theo Priestley, keynote speaker, author, and retrofuturist. If you'd like to appear as a guest and reminisce about futures gone by, get in touch. I've been your radio host, Andrew Helbig. Goodbye for now. <laughs>